Hi, welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship tonight as we take another look at Matthew. If you were with us last week, we were looking at Matthew chapter 11. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11 again, picking up in verse 20. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord and pray together. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together for this. Um, thank you for giving us a, a teachable spirit, the uh, ability to look at things objectively and to... Uh, make decisions off of the information we're given, but also to, to listen to your spirit, to listen to discernment as we look through your scriptures. Please bless us with that, Lord, and to and uh, bless us with a peace and quiet so we can hear what it is you're trying to teach us from the word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, uh, like I said, we're going to be picking up around verse 20. Now, last week we were talking a lot about the fact that basically we'll, you just can't make people happy. Um, John the Baptist was about as legalistically perfect as possible, uh, and they, could, like, they couldn't accept him because he, it was too much. It was too far. It's too out there. And uh, Jesus, on the other hand, was as personable as possible, willing to have dinner with publicans and sinners, you know, and uh, to have a drink. And uh, they were upset with him as well. You know, he's a glutton and a wine bibber. Um, so he's basically saying you can't make everybody happy. In fact, you can't even make anybody really truly happy um, with everything that you're doing. So. Uh, he's basically pointing out their inconsistencies on that. Uh, and then we move on to a different section of scripture here in verse 20. Uh, and he says, then he began to upbraid the cities, um, wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Now that's the King James. A lot of the other translations are similar. Uh, the American Standard Version, for instance, says they began to upgrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. It's a complete direct copy. Um, the, the ones that are a little bit different, like World English Bible says denounce the cities, but the general gist is the same, which is that this is when he really begins to speak out uh, about the fact that a lot of the places he went through and a lot of the places where he dedicated time and energy, in fact, where all of his miracles occurred, um, rejected him, rejected his message. And so he's, he's beginning to speak out because he wasn't speaking out before. I mean, when he first came to those places, a lot of them accepted him. At least they allowed him to come in and to preach, you know, whatnot. Um, but despite the fact that you see followers popping up in these places after he, he does things, like, you know, 4,000 people here and 5,000 people there, which is pretty big. I mean, that's, that's, that's not a small number. Um, you still end up with the city itself, with most of the people rejecting what he's done. They don't repent. They refuse to repent. Uh, and so he says, um, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. All right, so um, what he's talking about here is the fact that, okay, Tyre and Sidon were um, both cities of the Phoenicians. Uh, and they were known for kind of not being the most savory of places at the time. Uh, and so... They, they had that reputation, and they were punished for it. They were judged for it. Um, and he's referring to that when he's talking about Chorazin. Chorazin was a, a city to the north of Capernaum. Uh, Bethsaida was on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. So it was really close to Chorazin, probably three or four miles uh, to the south or southeast of Chorazin on a map. So there's, they're, they're really close together. Um, and the two of them have sort of this similar culture. And he, as he passed through them, um, he had, he had done a number of miracles and they refused to repent. So he's referring to 
uh, Tyre and Sidon, which are on in the Mediterranean, uh, but it, he's referring to, to Tyre and Sidon because of a prophecy about Tyre and Sidon that, that the Jewish people were aware of, uh, which comes out of Isaiah. So if you want to check that out, it's Isaiah 14, uh, verses 13 to 15 which says, uh, for thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of my, the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. All right, so if you remember, that should, should sound familiar because this is also the section that's talking about Satan. <laughs> So when you start that section in Isaiah, um, he says that he's talking about Tyre and Sidon. He's talking about Tyre and Sidon. And he's also, he says uh, in verse 12, though, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. So when, when Jesus is referencing Tyre and Sidon, and he says in Matthew uh, chapter 11, that um, that it, he says that here in verse 21, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What he's saying is essentially, well, he's actually saying three things, but what he's saying initially is essentially that they are worse off, that they are more messed up in the head than the people who, in prophecy, were connected to Satan's own demise. Now that is quite the statement, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and we see the tyrant side actually did end up uh, having the destruction that was prophesied to them come to place. Uh, it, it came to pass. But um, he's saying about Torazin and Bethsaida here in verse 22, what does he say? It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And Tyre and Sidon have been promised at the day of judgment to be cast into hell. So, you know. Um, so the second thing basically that he's saying there is that he knows everything. This is another one of those subtle claims to divinity. All right. Of course, you could also say that he was operating as a prophet. Um, those who believe that he was a prophet uh, could make that claim. And I can see where you're coming from. If God had told him uh, that and he operated off of the knowledge that God gave him, then sure, it would still be God's omnipotence and uh, omniscience. But in this case, what he's demonstrating is the fact that God knows what would have happened. God knows what could have happened which is a really mind-blowing idea. But um, in science today, if you will, uh, and going back for quite some time, there's this idea of parallel universes, an infinite number of universes in the multiverse that are connected on the basis of conscious decision-making. So every time a decision is made one way or another, then a, a whole new universe breaks apart. Of course, there are a lot of people who don't believe that. Those who don't believe in anything beyond the physical realm would have a hard time believing that because they would be applying the concept of, uh, of chemistry in the brain, basically, to, um, to the idea of consciousness. And therefore, since consciousness can be derived from chemistry, then there's no reason to believe that any alternate universe would ever exist because, after all, all of our decisions are essentially pre-made based on our brain chemistry. And... Uh, Anyway, it's kind of a foolish idea. It goes back to those hard questions about uh, creation and understanding, you know, God having created us as opposed to, uh, you know, the principle of design as opposed to the idea of evolution. But for those who don't believe in God and still do believe in um, science, but not in necessarily only the physical realm, um, the concept of, of multiple realities is a fascinating one to delve into. Um, and we have here in the Bible, essentially, proof as Christians from our, we have a supported stance to believe that 
God exists in all of those realities too, essentially. Um, they're all in his imagination, if you will. He can see every possible thing that could possibly happen, which is why he can speak with authority on the fact that had the mighty works, which were done in Tyre and Sidon, or I'm sorry, which were done in Chorazin and Bethsaida, been done in Tyre and Sidon instead, they would have repented. And he, he doesn't just stop what they would have repented. He adds in, of course, it's colloquial for saying that they were repenting completely. But he's adding in a detail, which is saying that they didn't just repent. They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Right? So um, he's speaking with authority. There. Uh, and the third thing that he's saying when he goes through this section is that um, not, not just that he's God, um, or, or rather, not just that he knows, but that he is God. Because he's referencing the fact that it was his mighty works that he did. He was the one that went into that area in order to spread the truth to them, and they are not responsive to that. All right, so he says then, and, and the reason why I can say that he's, he's saying that he's God is because he's demonstrating the ability to pass judgment. Verse 22, he says, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. All right, so he once again references the punishment um, of Satan when he says here in verse 23, And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, uh, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Sodom! All right, so first he references somebody who was connected with the idea of Satan. Then he says, in uh, in Sodom. Now, <laughs> uh, we all know what happened in Sodom, right? They didn't want to listen to God. He punished them. And he punished them by doing what? Literally raining fire and brimstone from heaven on them. That's how bad they were. Because of their disobedience. Because of their rebellion. And so he's saying, God is saying here, Jesus is saying that it's literally going to be worse for Capernaum than it will be for Sodom in the day of judgment. That's how bad they are. So he's making some pretty bold claims here. Um, and, and really pronouncing judgment like this is is kind of obviously it's going to be a divisive issue it's not going to be something that pulls people together it's not a warm and fuzzy it is not a tickling of the ears so he's he's kind of putting himself out there as well if he was just a man this would be these would be some dangerous fighting words that he's he's uh, giving here but instead he's pronouncing judgment because he's the king so verse 25 it says at that time jesus answered and said I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Okay, so the <laughs> it, it almost seems like Jesus is being a little bit sarcastic, almost. Um, The wise and the prudent here is pretty obviously referencing Jewish leadership. It's, it's referencing the, uh, the Sanhedrin. It's referencing the high priest. It's referencing the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And so by saying wise and prudent, um, he's... he's <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to put words in his mouth to say that he is poking fun at them, but he's saying they're not acting wise or prudent. All right? They're, they're, they're being foolish. It's not their fault, right? God hid it from them. Let's go. Thank you, Bodhi. All right, so um, one could also say instead of looking at 
and instead of looking at that as being sarcasm, one could also say that that he was referencing the fact that they were highly educated, that they were, you know, supposed to be rational leaders, that they were supposed to be capable. Um, and instead they chose to, to waste it. And finally, you could pull in scriptures like, for instance, um, uh, the one that says that uh, knowledge puffeth up, right? Um, we have a lot of education in the modern church and not very much passion. We have a lot of education, but not a lot of, um, of spirit. And I, I don't mean to put down people who are working hard in the modern church to learn. It's not a bad thing to try to learn, but if you replace the relationship with God with a scholastic understanding of Scripture, you will fail. Because the point of this is, you know, and I know everybody said relationship, relationship, relationship. Everybody talks about it. Everybody, you know references it a lot and so I'm kind of beating a dead horse but um I don't know everything about my wife I don't now I know a lot because I love her so as time goes on I learn more right I care things pop up in my head and it kind of sticks oh she really likes that you know but I'm learning it because it's a part of my relationship with her if I were to replace my relationship with my wife with a study of my wife it would break our relationship down very quickly. And I may know a lot about her afterwards, but it wouldn't be a good thing, right? So it's a focus that, that matters. It's, it's a change of focus. It's a perspective issue. Uh, and we, we, like the scribes and the Pharisees, often end up putting ourselves in this mindset of the more you know, the better. Uh, and I get it. I do. Um, if I didn't care enough about my wife to even figure out whether she liked chocolate or vanilla, um, that might be a problem. You know, thankfully I can, can pretty easily say that when it comes to ice cream, neither of the above, she'll go for chocolate chip cookie dough every time. Um, but that's, you know, that these are things you learn as time goes on in a relationship, right? Uh, and we have a relationship with God that's supposed to be the focus of it. So instead of going all out in one direction and ignoring the scholastic side of things where you look up the Greek and look up the Latin and do the word studies and answer the hard questions, right? Instead of ignoring that and instead of going in the, op in the complete opposite direction where you go crazy with the word studies and that's all you ever do and you 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 know, get a PhD in, in divinity, but you have no concept uh, of the love of God in your heart. You have one in your head, but you don't have one in your heart. It's pointless. It's useless. It's, it's, it's leftovers. Um, it's like a, a divorced man talking about his prior wife, you know? Sure, he knows a lot, but not a really good relationship there. So when we're looking at these scriptures, what we're seeing is, I think, you know, you could look at it in a couple of different ways, like I was saying, but I think we're looking at a, a sort of a relationship advice where Jesus says here, you know, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. And by babes, he's not talking about literal babies. He's talking about people who don't know so much that they are, you know, incapable of looking beyond their own nose. He's talking about giving discernment to those who are humble enough to actually learn rather than being stuck up in their knowledge so far that they claim themselves to be wise. You know, Romans 
Romans 1, 22 is talking about that. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Hmm. The wise. Kind of, sort of, sarcastically. All right, so let's move on. So verse 26, he says, Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. All right, so I told you earlier that he was bringing out his divinity. He was, he, he was referencing his divinity. Now he comes out and blatantly states it. All right now, you're going to hear most likely from a number of sources that uh, the only gospel where Jesus claims his own divinity is John. That is false. I mean, you, you got to... It, anyone reading this section who looks at it honestly will have to admit that when he calls God Father, he's talking as a son, and then he goes on to say, everything's delivered unto me. He's not talking unto me, generally speaking, talking about humanity. He's talking unto me, specific Jesus Christ. He says, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, and that Son is a very specific single Son, but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's talking as God. All right, He's not talking as a prophet. He's not talking as a good man. He's talking as God. In Matthew. Now, I'm not disparaging John. John is great, too. John can even be a little bit more explicit about it, where he says, hey, yeah, I am he, right? But um, this is clear that he's speaking with authority as God. It doesn't say go unto God. If you labor and are heavy laden, then God will give you rest. He says, come unto me. Of course, he means God, too, because he is telling people that they have to go to God. But when he says, you got to go to God, so come to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, do we have any questions so far? Let's see what we got. Okay, so was Capernaum elevated because the Lord lived there for a while? I'll have to table that. I'm not sure. I'd have to do some research to see why he says Capernaum was elevated. Correct. Not jaded with knowledge. I wish you'd come as children with an open, loving mind. That is absolutely correct. When we approach anyone as a um, as a child, as opposed to as an adult, there's a different method of instruction and there's a different method of learning. Um, I've had the opportunity recently to actually, the reason why this was a little bit delayed tonight, um, to teach a, a, an adult learning environment, to teach uh, um, actually a Medicare training class. Um, which is interesting. It's fun. It's, uh, a lot of talking loudly, but, um, in an adult learning environment, the rules are different. Now I've taught kids before, um, and obviously having done a lot of preaching over the last years, um, I'm, I'm aware of the differences in explaining things to an adult mind as opposed to a child's mind. But in an adult learning environment, the adults, you have to express to them why each point, why each topic is important to them. Why does it matter to them? Why should they care? You don't have to do that with a child. It's a different world. 
talking to a child as opposed to talking to an adult. And the reason that I say that is because Jesus knew that back then. He, he designed us. He should know, right? So when he says, come to me as a child, ask me a question as a child, he says, stop it with all of this practical stuff, all right? God is not a pragmatic God. God is a God of absolutes and impossibilities and miracles and signs and wonders and joy. God is a God of eternity and all power and all knowledge and imagination and creativity. God is not a God of pragmatism. All right, and when we come as jaded adults and we approach his truth with a pragmatic attitude, which I'll explain what I mean, it, when we approach his truth as if we're trying to figure out how it applies to us and why we should care, we, we cut him off at the pass. We, we, have, to, we have to approach God and this is going to sound wrong, so I might have to explain myself afterwards, but we have to approach God with an element of mysticism. <laughs> He's beyond our understanding. There are certain things which we will never understand. We have to take them at face value. And they may not necessarily directly apply to us, like the concept of the Trinity. Why does it matter? We could go into a number of reasons why it does matter in order to back up other things in Scripture, but does the concept of the Trinity specifically apply to your daily life? No. The odds are, and I'm not saying this to keep you from looking forward to his return, because we are supposed to do that, but the odds are that the events described in Daniel or Revelation aren't going to come to pass during your lifetime. They could. Right? We're looking forward expectantly for his coming. So why does it matter to study that? Besides the fact that, you know, even if it does happen, you're going to be all right. Why does studying the final judgment matter? Or who cares about the types of crowns you might get? Why does any of this stuff matter? See, a pragmatic view would say it doesn't matter. I don't need to know that. All I need to know is what I'm going to do. Let me just make sure I know where the lines are so I can stay in, inside the lines, and then I'll just march forward in that. And that, that, that's the way that leads to legalism. That's the way that leads you to shutting off all of your imagination and drying up inside. But when we approach God as a child, we approach him with wonder, which I suppose is a better way of saying instead of mysticism. We approach him with wonder. We approach him from a perspective of an infinite possibility. That's when he can reveal things unto us. So he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent who are locked up in their knowledge and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Hmm. So humility plays a large role in this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Christ describes himself that way, as being meek, which means that he is under control. He's not out of control. He's under authority, God's authority. Jesus said that he didn't do anything except that it was told to him to do by the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty big statement for someone who claims to be God. But he could follow through on that. He was meek. And he says he's lowly in heart. Hmm. 
The rest that he speaks of in verses 28 and 29 is the rest of grace. You know, when we approach God from a pragmatic view, we try to find out what really applies to us. We try to find out what we have to do to be better, to be perfect, to be, um, you know, uh, uh, whatever, fill in the blanks. When we, we try to find seven easy steps for, you know, this, um, we, we sort of warp ourselves and we put ourselves under extra strain and extra stress, unnecessary stress. We pick up burdens that we don't have to bear. We try to move ourselves from reliance on God to reliance on us. Uh, and so the burdens that he's asking people to put down are the burdens of the seven easy steps because they aren't easy. Um, you know, three things here and 10 things there and 14 things in another place and all, all these things that we have to live up to. And we can see where they come from scripture. We can see where they're useful. We can see where they apply. We can look at it and it makes sense. It sounds good. It points us in the right direction. A lot of times it gives us useful tips. Um, things like, how, how are you successful? How can you be successful? How can you be financially successful? How can you, you know, uh, approach the throne of, of God uh, in prayer? How can you, uh, whatever. And you'll see them all the time. These self-help guides, essentially, from spiritual gurus who are trying to point you in the right direction by pointing out the truths in Scripture. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying that that is, uh, you know, detrimental to your faith to look at those things and to use them as supplements. But when you approach God without having the basis be your relationship, it's the basis of your relationship is pragmatism, you know, is finding what works. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. All right, so the question being given here is, um, are you saying we should not approach God as an equal or to question and hold him accountable? Okay, so I am going to say very clearly I am not saying that we are supposed to be holding God accountable. All right? Um, that is not our place. That is way beyond our place. All right, what I'm talking about is trying to pull out practical points rather than understanding something that's theoretical. To, to be down to earth and common sense and to approach things from a, a sensible, um, straightforward perspective. Um, I get the allure, but the Christian faith and scripture is full of mysteries. It just is. And that's not a bad thing. And God will slowly reveal answers to you and the way that he wants you to operate in your life. And sometimes he's going to reveal one thing to one person and something else to someone else. And so you may not be allowed to drink alcohol, and someone else may. You may listen to one type of music, and somebody else may listen to another type of music. Because God's revealed something to one person and something else to someone else, and both are right. So there are mysteries that we just are not going to understand that are in Scripture. And when we try to approach Scripture pragmatically and commonsensically, God is not common sense. God is uncommon sense. God goes beyond our sense. So we have to understand it uh, out, of, out of wonder and awe. Like you say, yes, exactly. Humility to come to God out of wonder and awe, trying to figure out you know, what we are to do to fit into his grand plan rather than trying to look at his grand plan 
and figure out, you know, to, to, to parse it into to chewable little pieces so that we can, you know, uh, use them to, to build our own kingdom. It's, it's not the way it works. So that's, that's all that, um, that's all I'm going to talk on on that, or I'm going <laughs> to go a little too, too, too long on, on that verse. I don't want to be a dead horse there. Um, Matthew 11:30 says, "For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and indeed grace is easy and light." All right. Um, understanding the doctrine of grace, understanding that it's not up to us to save ourselves, it's not up to us to perfect ourselves. It's up to God who's working in us, his good pleasure, uh, to do that. It, it really, it brings you to a whole new dimension of relationship because you can move beyond the interview stage uh, and into more of the friendship stage um, where you allow God to do his good work in you and you put up with all the things that he's bringing into your life because you know that it's tempering you. It's bringing you to a new place. And it doesn't mean you're not going to continue study. It doesn't mean you're not going to want more knowledge. Uh, and you may even be voraciously devouring documents, all trying to split up the word of God into things that you can understand. And that's great. But if it, you know, uh, if it's replacing your relationship is when it becomes a problem. That's all that is. All right. So that finishes out chapter 11. We are going to start with chapter 12 um, later. Uh, that's going to be next week. I think chapter 12 is going to end up being a very fun chapter. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I would just point out uh, in chapter 11 that the, the, the questions that you guys have had, they're good questions. Um, you can always go to like, uh, you can go to a couple of different commentaries there's Matthew Henry commentary is a pretty good commentary on this chapter. Uh, you can go to um, Bible study websites. You can look at different uh, types, different translations to give you a good uh, perspective on it. But the most important thing that you're going to do is to, to pray and to think about it, really. Um, because it's not so much, you know, difficult word studies that's going to give you insight here. It's going to be the Spirit of God that's going to give you insight. All right, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer real quick. Lord, thank you so much for opening our eyes to truth in your word. And uh, thank you for uh, leaving us this record in Matthew. I pray that you would help us to shy away from the legalism of practicality uh, and to move into an understanding and acceptance of the uh, wonder of your wondrous works. And, uh, please bless us with that perspective change, Lord, and uh, with a stronger relationship with you as we move into the rest of this week. And I just ask that you would bless us uh, with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Go with God. <laughs>